Hey, my dear storytellers, it's Mary Rose here. It's Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Here I am broadcasting from lovely Southern California. It's a pretty nice place to be. Cannot complain. Um, this is when I go live every week to talk with you about story structure, writing craft, and the mindset of a thriving, working writer. And the longer we do this practice, the more we discover how much that mindset piece has an impact on the proceedings, not only on whether the proceedings are productive, by which I mean whether we're actually getting our writing practice done, whether we're making progress, whether we're going anywhere with it, but also on the quality of joy that we bring to the proceedings, whether it feels like a slog or whether it feels like we are at play in the field of storytelling. Now, which sounds like more fun to you? I'd rather be at play in the field of storytelling myself. Doesn't mean it's not work, but our mindset does make all the difference. So I want to say hello. We've got some uh, folks watching live. I'm very pleased to see you. Hey, Terry. Hey, Chris. Hey, Cynthia. Hey, Nancy. Um, and anybody else who's watching who hasn't left a comment, but who's out there. And of course, anyone who's watching the replay, I see you too, kind of, you know, from, from my heart, the eye of my heart sees yours as well. Today, we're going to talk about speed. <laughs> we're going to talk about speed or lack thereof. The question on the table for us to discuss today is how fast should you write? Should, should, there's my little air quotes. How fast should you write? Is there a right answer to this question? Is there a correct answer to the question of how fast you should write? Is writing quickly better than writing slowly? Or is writing slowly better than writing quickly? Which is it? Um, it's easy to say it depends, but of course it does depend. It not only depends on who you are as a person and as a writer, what your tendencies are, um, but it also depends on what you are personally doing. So there's no, it's not just that there's a no right answer that applies across the board to all writers. There's no answer that's going to hold true for you personally at every single point in your writing process. And that's one of the things I want to talk about today because, uh, you know, it was, when the answer comes too quickly and is too simple, usually it means we're, we're asking the wrong question. So how fast should you write is sort of the wrong question because there is no answer to that question. But what I want to do today is I want to unravel the whole topic of the speed of our writing, the pace of our writing, because there's so much said about it and there's so much curiosity about it. And uh, I want to unravel that, and then I want to give you some practical things to think about so that you can decide what approach to your writing is going to serve you best at that moment. All right. So I think we're going to have we're going to have a good discussion today. Um, I'm always interested in your comments. If you've got stuff to say about this topic or questions that are on your mind about this topic of how fast you should write, please feel free to leave them in the comments so we can weave them into the conversation. So it's funny, I, I send out an email to everyone who's on my mailing list, and I hope all of you are, uh, every Tuesday, just kind of explaining what the topic's going to be and uh, trying to, uh, you know, like a little trailer, a little a little uh, appetizer to whet everyone's curiosity about what's going to happen on Wednesday. And this was one that right away people were like, oh, yeah, this is an interesting question. This is an interesting topic. And, and some folks posted really interesting examples in the Facebook group of books that were written really quickly and books that were written really slowly. And um, if you if you look that up, you know, there are classic books that were written in a in a couple of months. There were books that people worked on for years, you know. So it's a source of fascination. And the question is compelling and it's also very common. And I have to say as someone who's done a lot of author events, panels, 
you know, I used to do a lot of, uh, I did book tours, a lot of in-person type things. You take questions from the audience or at writing conferences. This comes up a lot because it's a real writer's question. If someone always asks, they oh, there are certain questions that will always get asked anytime a professional author is put in front of people who are, you know, on the path of, of trying to, to move their own writing practices along. Um, how long did it take you to write it? How long did it take you to write it? And and so we get used to answering these questions. But the the answer is, does it matter, right? What's more interesting to me is why is this the most common question? Maybe maybe it's a tie with where did you get the idea? That's That's also a very common question. But how long did it take you to write it is always, always there. And I long ago came to read that question, you know, to hear it, not as they really care. Like, what difference does it make if it took me 13 months, 15 months, 16 months, two months? Like, what difference does it possibly make how long it took to, for me to write it? Like, how, what can that do for anyone? What are they asking? They're asking the eternal question that writers ask, um, more experienced writers, when they have the opportunity to, you know, grab them by the lapels and, and shake answers out of them. They want to know, I, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? So when they ask me, how long did you take to write that book that's piled up on the tables behind you that you're going to sign with a Sharpie in a couple of minutes? What they really want to know is I'm a writer too, or at least I think I am, or, or I'm trying to be. And I don't know if I'm doing it right. And I'm looking for clues. And I'm hoping that you're going to tell me something that reassures me that I'm doing this right writers are always obsessed with process. We're obsessed with other writers' process. For this very reason, we actually want to know, like, am I, am I doing this right? And it sounds so neurotic, and that's all right. It, it's not neurotic. It's, it's inevitable curiosity because, as you may have heard me say before, but it, it bears repeating, when we are developing as writers, we don't have the opportunity to be inside the head of a more experienced writer and see exactly how it's done. And so we, we're we operating from a place of tremendous anxiety. If you could imagine, you know, trying to learn, you know, to do something complicated, something as complicated as writing fiction, you never get to see anyone do it. You only get the result. You only get to see the result. It's, it's, it's stressful. It's maddening. So, of course, there's anxiety about whether you're doing it right. Um, but the problem is that when we ask how long it took to write something, we are asking for metrics. We're asking for measurements. Oh, I'm going to apologize right now. My cats are have decided to have a little fight in the room with me. I don't know why, but if you hear hissing and yowling, it's because Ralph and Peaches are having a, sib a sibling moment. They're really funny. Guys, do you mind? Oh, they're looking at me with such chagrin right now. Like, oh, did we do anything wrong? We're so sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so let me let me come back to our discussion. We'll leave Ralph and Peaches to their sibling rivalry. They'll sort it out. They make a lot of noise, but they don't actually hurt each other. So, when I say metrics, what I mean is like there are certain things that are easy to measure, right? We can we can measure things that are observable. And something like how long did it take you to write that book is measurable. It's observable, all right? And so it's one of the things that can be reported upon. It's a lot easier, in fact, to say, oh, it took me 15 months than it is to say, to answer the question, well, where'd you get the idea? It's like, well, that's, you know, that's actually kind of an internal complicated question. I've probably been getting this idea in bits and pieces for 20 years, right? But we come up with a short answer because that's what people have time to, to process, to hear. So, but length of time is measurable. Here's the other question that people ask, like how many words a day do you write? It's measurable. These are observable. They're quantities. Now, is it bad to measure these things? Am I putting down, you know, am I trying to put down the idea of measuring? It is absolutely not bad. It's great to measure things. And here's why. This is a piece of life wisdom that I offer to you that applies to writing and other things. You cannot manage what you do not measure. 
I want you to think about that. You may have heard that before. It's, this is not a saying that's original to me. But you cannot manage what you do not measure. This is true, for example, of our finances. You cannot manage your household budget, your finances, your retirement plan if you don't know what you have, if you don't bother to look at your bank account, if you don't try, if you don't keep track of your spending, if you don't even know what you earn. You can't manage anything if you don't take time to measure it. Um, the same is true with people who have fitness and nutrition goals. You know, uh, I, I, at the urgings of my son, who's a real uh, expert on fitness, I, I've started lifting weights recently because it's good for my health, especially at my age. And and if I don't if I don't write down what I did, like if last week I was able to use a, a twenty pound dumbbell, and and this week I go in again, like I don't. I can't manage the process. I cannot manage my 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 pro, my procession through a, a trying to get more fit if I don't keep track and measure. Well, last time twenty pounds, it was easy, so this time I'll lift it. Right, I'll raise the weights. This kinds of thing. So it's true in every aspect of our lives that we cannot manage what we don't measure. And when we're what we're trying to manage is our writing practice. We seek what we can measure. And the things that we can measure are things like how long are we taking to 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 do to finish books? How many words are we doing per day, per week, per month, right? So here's the caveat. When you choose what to measure, you change everything. You are actually choosing an outcome. Because if you measure the wrong thing, you're incentivizing putting your energy in the wrong place. Um, I think a very easy example that will probably be familiar to a lot of you is if you look at publicly held corporations and what they measure is like quarterly returns. They, they What they're measuring is a very a short-term metric then they make decisions that are designed to make the numbers look good every 90 days, as opposed to making decisions that might guarantee the long-term health of the company or the long-term benefit of the customers, the shareholders, the employees, right? What you measure starts to control the outcome. It starts, it really does start to manage the process. And so if you start to measure things like how long does it take and what's my word count, we have to examine how that impacts the outcome that you're going to get. So let me share a couple of anecdotes. And these are composite stories. I'm not calling out anyone in particular. I just want to make that really clear. I've worked with about a zillion, talk about a measurement, many, many, many writers in my many years of teaching. So these are the kinds of anecdotes that are easily uh, represented by, by many different people. So ima imaginary student A, um, we'll call her, um, the concern uh, of this person was not so much how fast they could finish the draft or how fast they could get, you know, how many word, what's their word count or, you know, stuff like that. This particular person was measuring how quickly they could get an agent. They just really wanted to get an agent. They felt, and I think this is easy to relate to, that if they had an agent, then they knew that they were a real writer and it was worth all the effort and that the book was good enough to keep working on, you know. And so they, they had a book in process, but their real goal was to get an agent. And the book was very long and the book was not you know, it wasn't really that well edited, you know, it was, it was a done, it was a draft and, and they wanted to query. They, they wanted to get the query letters out the door. And so what they were measuring was how many query letters am I getting out the door and how fast am I getting responses and how, how many no's am I getting and how many yeses am I getting? And, you know, how long is it going to take me to get an agent? Now, if this, um, um, uh, this, if this story uh, 
ended happily, right? Ended the, probably the way the, the person wants. They they get an agent, but the book is also ready. You know, they get an agent, but the book has somehow brought itself to be marketable while they were paying attention to these other measurements. But see, that's not what was happening. They weren't measuring how fast is it going to be uh, for me to get this book ready for the reader. They That that was too far away. It was kind of an abstraction. That, that's the kind of measurement that's a little a little less consoling. It feels a little more precarious, right? So they were just really focused on that. And so, um, and so, you know, as a mentor, I say to a person in this predicament, I say, don't be in a rush to query. Don't be in a rush to go look for an agent. If the manuscript still needs more work, maybe your time is better spent doing that first. Because you're really, you know, you, you don't want to burn too many bridges with agents who say, yeah, it's interesting, but it's not there yet. Come back to me when it's there, right? But if you're in a hurry to get an agent, you query. And so, so that is an example of measuring something that then created an outcome. And what's the outcome? The outcome is that it takes a long time to get an agent because the book's not really ready. An agent may take it on on the on the condition that it needs a lot of work. And so you get the agent, but then you spend a year doing rewrites that the agent is now supervising. And the agent is giving you notes and things are starting to get confusing because, you know, this is maybe not the rewrite you had in mind. And, you know, and then what's going to happen? Then maybe the book will be ready to go to market, right? But at, at this point, there's a lot of time has been spent. And, um, and when he gets in front of an editor at a publishing house, you know what's going to happen. They're going to give notes and they're going to want rewrites too. So how much time did that writer save? All right. So let's just put that anecdote aside. There's another kind of prototype of a student who measures or a writer who, who measures um, maybe not the optimal thing, you know, but this could be the optimal thing. And this is one a, a great example of how it depends. This is a writer who says, to themselves, I just want to measure, what I'm measuring is how long it takes me to get a complete draft. I just need to have a complete draft. That's what I need. I need to get to the end. I need to have a, a full version of this book, no matter how imperfect. I just need to see it finished. I need to see it finished. I'll rewrite it later. I know it's going to take a lot of work, but I just need to get to the end. So that's what they're measuring. And so that is a writer who has prioritized I would say um, mitigating their anxiety that they're never going to finish it. That's what that feels like to me, that this is a writer who's really worried that they're never going to finish it. And so what seems most valuable to them, and it may well be, see, I'm not going to say this is a bad decision. I just want you to see how the different things we measure will impact how we approach this question of how fast should we write. Um, this writer, the, the, that just may be what they need to do. They need a full draft and they're willing to spend lots of time revising it later. Okay. And, um, and they too are prioritizing the measurement of the completed draft over what is an alternate measurement, which is how long will it take this book to be ready for the reader, truly finished, ready for the reader. And that would be the third thing to measure, you know, like the first, the first anecdote is how long is it going to take me to get an agent to represent this book? The second one is how long is it going to take me to get a finished manuscript, no matter how sloppy and in need of revision. But the third one, and I'm just going to put it to you guys, that this may be a measurement that many writers ignore, but it is ultimately the only one that matters, which is how long is it going to take for me to get this project finished, ready to be put in the reader's hands. Now, if that's your measurement, if that's the timeline that you're looking at, you may make different choices than the writer who's just trying to get to a, a end of a messy first draft or the writer who's just trying to get the book in the marketplace so that they can work on it with help. The truth is that these writers are all going to approach their writing differently one of them is is going to be pretty sloppy about the first draft because they're really worried about the query letter and the agent, and they are waiting for people to help them to revise. The second writer is just mitigating anxiety about getting, you know, 
not quitting in the middle, wanting to get to the end. But the third writer is thinking along the long game. And they may proceed quite slowly. And it may really end up being a, a replay of that old fable, Aesop and the Fables of the Tortoise and the Hare, where the if the finish line of getting an agent, well, the first writer is going to get the agent first, sure, possible. But if the finish line is when is the book ready to be put in the reader's hands, it's possible that the third writer, who is definitely going to be the tortoise of this particular pack, may get to the finish line first. If they choose to approach the work very methodically, very intentionally, take their time, you know, solve problems as they come up, slow and steady, they may, in fact, win the race. Now, it sounds like in comparing these like little composite anecdotes that I'm saying that slow is better and working methodically is better and that, you know, books that are written in a flash are, you know, are not going to succeed. And that is obviously not the case. And I'm not arguing that at all. And I want to I want to be very clear about this. Under many circumstances, a race between a tortoise and a hare, the hare is going to win. Okay, the hare goes faster than the tortoise. The hare is very likely to win. But so much depends on what we're trying to accomplish. So let's look at those, let's go even a little deeper into those different ways of measuring our progress. All right, I'm going to call these the tortoise, tortoise versus hare questions that you can ask yourself. These are ways for you to make decisions about what is needed in your work right now at this particular phase of your process and perhaps in relationship to this particular project because different projects will have different vibes. So this, so, so the question of what we measure and how it affects our pays, this is the most important one. I'm gonna start with it. Are we measuring word count or are we measuring story energy. So it's a word count versus story energy. So let me talk about this a little bit. Measuring word count is a, such a commonplace among writers. They like, I wrote 500 words today. It was a bad day. It wasn't enough. I wrote a thousand words today. That was my goal. Good for me. I wrote 5,000 words today. It's amazing. I had a great day. You know, they, it's measurable. It's something that can be observed, and so therefore you can pat yourself on the back about it. But if you wrote 500 words in which you nailed a big turning point in the story, and you and you really got it, you really figured it out, and you and you got it down in words, and you were like amazing, like that was that the missing puzzle piece, you know, the stone that holds up the whole arch. That was it. Versus writing 5,000 words that in which you described what everybody in the book was wearing because you just wanted to write a lot of words. Who had the better writing day? See, it depends what you measure. If you're measuring word count, the, the all of that description is like, oh, well, that was better. But if you're measuring story energy, the writer who really cracked the scene and who wrote the moment upon which, you know, the plot hinges and then said, okay, I'm done for the day. That was a good day's work. They, I'm going to say they won. This is definitely a case where I would measure the story energy as a win. Here's the problem. You know, we love words and many writers just default to words because getting words on paper is as difficult as it may seem some days is vastly easier than solving story problems. And this is why, my friends, you know this if you've been watching these videos, I talk about story structure so much, and I call it the foundation of our writing practice for this very reason. It's like solving the story questions is really what our job is. And the words are ultimately a delicious uh, means of conveyance, getting that story from here through the ether and into the reader's mind. I have, Ralph is now coming to apologize. Let's see if he jumps in my lap to say hi. He's such a funny boy. So, um, so if we're measuring word count versus if we're measuring story energy, we may have a different need for speed, right? We may have a different need for speed. 
Um, this has an impact on those of you who think about pantsing versus plotting as being sort of mutually exclusive. By pantsing, I mean you sit down to work and you don't really have much notion of what is happening uh, in advance. You're there to discover. You're there to figure it out. Whereas plotting traditionally is, um, here's my fella. There he is. Another photo bomb from Ralph. Plotting is traditionally the working out in advance of what's going to happen. And the really disciplined plotter has got the whole book worked out in advance. And when they sit down to work, they're, they're just, you know, they're saying, oh, today I write the scene in which these five things happen. And they just, they put it into words, you know, they just kind of fill in the blanks. Um, as you probably know, if you've been watching these videos, I am neither um, a pantser nor a plotter in my own practice, nor do I tell um, people who come to me for instruction and mentorship that one is better than the other. Instead, what I, what I want to convey is that we all have to tap in to the spirit of creativity, the serendipity of making discoveries as we work. We all have to, we all have to get our pantsing vibe together. You know, we all have to be able to do it. The improvisatory nature of creation will take us, uh, the best things in, in our work are going to, are going to be the result of unplanned excursions, you know? It's because as we as we work, we get into the flow state. Our conscious mind is not controlling everything, and the really juicy, unexpected, delicious things pop up. So we all have to be able to do that, but we also have to be able to shape them into a plot. And it's not necessary to choose one over the other. In fact, all writers must do both. The question is, which one are you going to be ruled by? And if you find yourself measuring word count and you're a pantser, you have to be really careful because it's really easy for a pantser to write lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of words that have no business being in the book. Now, anyone who's ever had to declutter an apartment knows that it's a lot harder to declutter something that's filled with clutter than it is to start with a blank slate and furnish it like, you know, with minimalist discipline. It's a lot harder to throw things away sometimes than it is to be really intentional about what to add. And so this is the, this is the danger of measuring word count instead of story energy. Uh, a plotter, of course, can get into trouble as well because they may have worked out in advance what happens, but they may not be open to the true influxes of powerful story energy that are coming to them intuitively as they get to know the world of their story better, as they get to know their hero better. And so they too can kind of cut themselves off. They can self-sabotage a little bit by by being too... Uh, rigorous, too um, regimented is the word I'm looking for in their process. So just think about what to measure. It's not a question of pantsing versus plotting. It's are you measuring word count or are you measuring story energy when you assess the speed at which you're working? Okay, so that's an interesting tortoise versus hare dial that you can turn. It's kind of a good way to think of it. Um, here's another one. Are you in a mode where um, I will call this like the white heat form of writing, like when you write something in a white heat of inspiration versus the slow and steady, the working in short periods of time that you have available to work intermittently, maybe not every day, maybe a few days a week, or maybe you have a routine where maybe there's one day a week that you can work, you know, it's slow and steady. It's not, it's not like, shut the doors. I'm locking myself in a hotel for two weeks and I'm going to crank out this, you know, a masterpiece. So that's what I mean by a white heat, white heat of inspiration versus a slow and steady building piece by piece. Now there are books that were written in a white heat that have endured. And there are many books that are written with a slow and steady approach that have endured. But here's what, here's what's um, to consider about those two. To work at a white heat is requires an intense focus. 
um, it's a kind of a hyper focus approach to a project. And anyone, even a person who has a more, uh, like my temperament is more of a slow and steady temperament in terms of writing. But even I have had the experience of, say, going to a two week writing retreat or, you know, going on a resident, having a residency where the interruptions of the outside world are, uh, are removed. And that there's an intention that this is writing time. This is special time. This is you and your work. And the amount of productivity that can happen in an environment like, it, like that, where you're allowed to hyper-focus, is tremendous, potentially. There are other experiences where writers put so much pressure on themselves because it's such a big deal to take a week, to take two weeks out of their busy lives and go someplace and say, I'm going to write. That's what I have ahead of me now. I've, I've got two weeks. I'm going to write at a white heat. I'm going to get a masterpiece done in a short amount of time. But it just doesn't work that way. And that that amount of pressure actually backfires. And they find themselves discovering just how capable of procrastination they are. That is a thing that happens as well. So ask yourself, what is the relationship that you have with focus? That's really what this is about. If you benefit from periods of intense focus, then it's possible that creating opportunities for you to write really fast might be a benefit. You might find that they are restorative, just like, you know, I might do yoga a couple of times a week, but then if I go on a yoga retreat and I immerse myself for a few days, it's, you know, it brings my practice to the next level. It's like, oh, I really got to concentrate on this for a while, right? You can create those kinds of experiences for yourself if you feel that you will respond well to focus, that you will respond well to that kind of structure, that kind of magic time taken out of the everyday. And that could be a scenario in which no matter what your typical speed is, you may say, no, no, I'm just going to, I'm just going to write. I'm just going to write so much. I'm just going to let it rip. I'm not going to worry too much about things. I'm not going to measure too much. I'm just going to let this time be magic. And that's really fruitful. That's a really fruitful thing to do. Other ways that writers create the sense of focus for themselves, if they need a little boost, right, a little extra juice in the focus department, is to participate in like timed writing sprints. There are so many of these. Lots of people do them online now. Many people enjoy them. You know that you're going to log on to a Zoom call or something like that at a certain amount, of, at a certain time. There's going to be a few other writers there and someone's going to say go and you've got 20 minutes and just head down and you're, you're just trying to get as much done before the bell goes off, right? So a timed writing sprint could be an experiment, a way of playing with speed. Um, anybody who's ever done like training for a marathon, right? You know that one of the ways that you can supercharge your fitness is by doing like a high intensity interval, like a hill work or sprinting. And so just see what I'm, see what I'm driving at here. I'm saying that you can play with speed. You can figure out how playing with the speed of your writing can help you discover things not only about the book you're working on, but about your own response to different stimuli, you know, different ways that you can manage it. So uh, the other thing, of course, that will create a sense of focus is a deadline. Now, many, many writers participate in critique groups for this reason. And, and, and this reason is enough sometimes to be part of a critique group, even if you're not particularly interested in getting feedback right now, being in a group where you have to show up on a certain day and present a couple of pages is a deadline. And for many writers, that deadline is the thing that helps create the focus that they need to get some work done. And so they may find themselves writing quickly right before the deadline. Now, I don't recommend, you know, relying upon your adrenal glands to manage your writing practice. I don't recommend it. 
But I do understand that at times, if we put extra pressure on ourselves, we will rise to the occasion. And so this is a tool that I want you to remember that you can use to manage your own relationship to the pace of your work. The last thing I want to talk about um, in terms of these like tortoise versus hare dials, right? We talked about what you're measuring. Is it word counter story energy? We talked about uh, the difference between the white heat hyper focus and the slow and steady. It's on the calendar. I show up for my writing practice at a predetermined time and how you can tweak that, give yourself a little urgency if you need it. So the third and last one I want to talk about is, is your mental state. And so the tortoise versus hair question here is, what is the relationship between your momentum and your resistance? Mm, this is important. Now, all writers struggle with resistance. All creative people st struggle with resistance. I'll go out on a limb. I'll say all human beings, except the truly exalted ones, struggle with resistance. It's just, it's such a normal part of human psychology. We have, um, and physiology, I should say, right? Because our nervous systems are running the show here and they have programming. And the programming is that when we're in danger, we recoil, we fight, we flee or sometimes we play dead. We just sort of sink into a, you know, a passivity. And the way that plays out, of course, in our advanced civilized lives as sentient humans with, you know, all of this, all of this frontal lobe stuff going on all the time is that we get in our own way very easily. We, we get, um, we flee from the work. <laughs> we flee from the work. We fight with the work. We fight with ourselves about the work. We start to say, oh, I'm not able to do this. You know, we come up with labels. Um, and Or we just become completely passive and we ignore it. And this is there's all kinds of ways resistance plays out. We have talked about resistance at length here uh, before on the channel. So you, I know that you guys know what I'm talking about. But momentum can be an interesting way for some writers to manage their resistance or their fear of resistance. There's a sense of if I just get going and I don't stop, then I'll get somewhere. But if I let myself stop, all the resistance is gonna come surging up, right? Like a geyser, and then I'm gonna have to deal with it all. So it's an interesting, self-hack, if you will, and that the writers who really love that white heat process, who really love hyper-focus um, and just, you know, being away uh, out of it, you know, I can't write unless I know I can just be alone for two weeks and then I can really get some work done, you know, that, those kinds of statements. That To what extent are you trying to use momentum to manage resistance? It's a really interesting thing to look at. Because um, that's not the best way to manage resistance. You know, the thing is, if we're always on the run from resistance, we haven't managed it at all. So you have to look at your resistance because at that point, you've put your resistance in charge of your writing process. If you're just starting to, to believe things that, oh, no, speed is how I go. Speed is how I have to go. Because if I don't go fast, I won't go at all. So I want you to really think about that. I'd love to know if that rings any bells for anyone. So how fast should you write? How fast should you write? Depends on so much, right? I wanted to um, to sort of wrap this up uh, by talking about the uh, all of that it depends piece because how, you you have decisions to make about how fast you write, what you're measuring, what outcome you're aiming for at any point in the process, at any point in your development as a writer, at any particular point in the creation of a particular book. Th things will change. Things will change. I have had a few friends in my life who were opera singers, and one of the things that they always had in common and that I always found fascinating was that they always talked about their voices in the third person. So it wasn't just me and my voice. It was me and the voice. How's the voice today? I'm working on the voice. What are you doing? Ah, the voice is not having a good day. You know, um, 
I had an audition and the voice really, really did a good job. You know, that there's this I interesting habit uh, of putting a little separation between themselves and the instrument that happens to live inside their bodies. And what's useful, I, you know, when you first encounter this, it just seems like an affectation, right? But when you think about it, and when you think about it as a writer, because we too play an instrument that lives in our bodies, right? It's between your ears. This is where it comes from. So we too have this complex relationship with the instrument, with the thing that we're doing. And, and the impulse to confuse it with us. I am my brain, therefore I am my writing, therefore everything about this is personal. And if I am going fast and I'm worried that I should be going slowly, it's going to cause a, a big internal conflict. And if I'm writing slowly and I think I should be going faster, it, it calls my self-worth into question, right? That's not helpful. And so if we could, you know, borrow a tune from the opera singer practice, if we could see our writing practice as the instrument that we have, that we manage, that we take care of, and that we can choose how to manage, that we can choose what to do with, um, then we can truly start to be the boss of our writing practice. We can manage it. We can truly manage it. And then we can choose what is most fruitful to measure at any given point without getting our identity mixed up in it, without thinking like, oh, I'm so slow. I'm so slow. I'm such a slow writer, right? It's got nothing to do with you. It's the writing. It's the voice. What does the writing need right now? Does it need you to go fast? Does it need hyper-focus? Does it need you to create a deadline or a retreat for yourself? Or, you know, does it need that? Or does it need for you to stop measuring word count and start measuring story energy? Does it need for you to, to just change your mind about what you're measuring for now? so that it can keep making progress toward the only finish line that matters, which is when is it going to be done and ready for the reader? Now, I want you to really think about this separation because if, because if you are just identified with your writing practice and there's no separation, this is what's hard to conceive of. It's hard to conceive of how many tools you have at your disposal, right? A person who is, um, you know, a jack of, uh, you know, handyman is really skillful, can build a whole house, you know, has so many tools, like they've got a truck full of tools. And they come in to build a house and they choose which tools are called for today. What am I doing today? Am I excavating? Am I laying foundation? Am I pouring concrete? Am I hooking up electrical? Like, think of all of the tools that would be in a truck that would allow a person who had the skill to address each very different task as it was called for. They're not all called for at the same time. They're called for when they're called for. We're building a house here. The only finished line that matters is when is the house ready for someone to come live in it? Writing fiction is complicated. It involves all of these different trades, if you will, right? To use my construction metaphor. And if you keep thinking, no, I am, I don't have a truck. It's me. It's all just me. You're cutting yourself off from one of the real truths of being a practicing artist, which is no, it's not you. You have a lot of tools. And the journey to mastery involves recognizing just how many different tools there are, learning to use all of them, and then knowing which tool is the one for the moment, which tool is the one you need for this job. And so I invite you to think of this question of writing fast versus writing slow in this way, because sometimes writing fast is useful. Sometimes it is not useful. Sometimes being really intentional and taking your time is what is called for. And it requires a different set of tools to work really slowly, to go word by word, perhaps in a revision or a final polish. 
than it does to sit there in a dream state with your eyes half closed and just, you know, try to get as many, you know, free write as many words on the page as possible. It's a different mental state. It's a different set of tools. So I invite you once again, be the boss of your book. Try to get a little objectivity. Your self-worth as a human being has nothing to do with your writing, but your writing is still personal, just as if you build a gorgeous house, you will take pride in it. You know, you will take tremendous pride in it. And the love and care that you put into every aspect of it will be felt by the people who are lucky enough to live in it someday. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm, uh, Nancy just posted a comment that I'm going to pull up in a minute. I want to see if anyone else has any questions at, um, uh, as well. But I, so my closing imagery, I just have to share this, you know, know what you're measuring, decide what you're measuring, be intentional about it. All right. A gallon of water. You, if someone says, how much do you have? And you say a gallon, you know, a gallon of water is not a gallon of wine. You know, a gallon of water is not a gallon of jet fuel know what you're measuring okay have an intention about it and see if you can start to explore this this concept of of managing your entire process through the process of, of through the intentionality of what you measure and how that impacts your your pace all right so I started out thinking about this because I, I really did get a bee in my bonnet once when somebody told me, oh, you're a slow writer. You're a slow writer. Because in my mind, I was like, I, how many, you know, how many books do I have to publish a year in order to not be a slow writer? Like I've, I've published a lot of books. So clearly, you know, I'm not slow at all. There are writers who take many years to finish a book. Are they slow? You know, uh, we don't know what was going on during that time, but what we do know is that is that they they were managing their process the best way they knew how, and if they were floundering and they were slow because they were floundering, that's not productive. So one of the things that I want this talk to help you with is to not feel like it's not up to you. It's up to you how fast you work. It's up to you. So take some of these thoughts to heart and. Uh, let them inflect your writing practice. So let me bring this up. Nancy, I just love this comment. So Nancy says, I love the idea of having a relationship with your writing. It's a new paradigm, but totally resonates. Makes me feel like it can be managed at last. This is, it's just such a great thing to take to heart. I really appreciate that, Nancy. Thank you. Well expressed. It can be managed at last. Of course it can be managed. Of course it can be managed. There's a great quote that is attributed to Picasso about um, artists, you know, how artists think and that that um, when uh, the quote goes something along the lines of, you know, when art critics gather to talk about the paintings, they talk about, you know, theme and form and composition and color theory and all this stuff. But when painters gather to talk about painting, they talk about where to buy the cheap turpentine. You know, the, the practice of being an artist is a practice. We call it writing craft because we are craftspeople. And it doesn't feel that way when you're reading a book. When you're reading a book, it feels like magic, a good book, right? It feels like magic. It feels like somehow you're being transported. But that is not the feeling of the craftsperson necessarily, right? And, and it gives a false expectation that the process of writing the book is the process of being transported into an imaginary world that somehow exists full-blown. It's as if we saw all these beautiful finished houses, but we'd never seen anyone build one, and we just thought they were there. They just appeared one day. <laughs> uh, but we would not do a very good job of setting out to build a house if we didn't realize that, that how intentional, how much craftsmanship, how much tapping away at things with you know, a lot of measurement is involved with making something that really works. So uh, stick to that idea, Nancy. Take that idea to heart and see where it brings you. I think it's going to be really fruitful. All right, my friends. 
I hope this was was uh, interesting to you guys. You know, one of the things that I'm just scanning for questions, you can go ahead and post any questions right now. And so I can see them before we wrap up. But I do want to say that one of the things that provoked this as well, in addition to my own experience, of, of and this was some years ago, of, of not liking being called a slow writer when I never thought of myself that way at all, was that there's a, a lot of folks right now who are uh, teaching and practicing uh, a certain approach to being a, a published author that is very much within the world of the independent publishing community, where the key, uh, people are being told, the key to being successful as an independently published author is this incredible volume of work that you have to write series, you have to put out, you know, the first three volumes of the series in the first month, and then you've got to follow up with a new book every six weeks and, you know, and, and I just want to point out if anyone has encountered that kind of advice out there, that I'm not going to argue with people who are doing that and, and are getting what they want out of it. That's, that's totally valid. But this is a system that is derived, I believe, in part from trying to figure out like the algorithm, right? How the algorithm of the Amazon self-publishing platform works and how it rewards volume and frequency of publishing. And, and these are people who are looking for a particular outcome. So what they're measuring is they're, they're, uh, the algorithm is what is measuring. They're not even doing the measuring. They're trying to get the measurements to match up with the Amazon algorithm. Now, I didn't get into the writing business or the art, the storytelling business in order to concern myself with the Amazon algorithm, I'm not saying it doesn't matter for book sales, but just know <clears throat> that the expectations of people who are doing that, that you got to write 10,000 words a day, or you'll never keep up. They are on a whole different path. And that path is going to lead them to where they want to be. And, and I'm not judging anybody's choice about it. But don't let those kinds of casual numbers seep into your thinking if that's not what you're going for. It just is really amazing to me how much of that talk, uh, you know, is, is how much of that chatter is out there. There's so much chatter in the writing community. All right. So that was one of the things that provoked it. I just turned in a manuscript to my agent that's a 20,000 word manuscript. So a rather short book, but a perfectly delightful length for a, a middle grade book that's going to be illustrated. And if the, you know, if I were writing the 10,000 words a day, I could right? Oh, it, it's a two day book. You could write that book in two days. You know, I worked on that book from, I guess, about November until uh, I'm, I'm recording this on September 1st to last month. And why does it take so many months to write 20,000 words? You tell me, you know, is the amount of time that it's going to take that book to be ready for the reader, really that going to be much more, you know, than if I had written it, if I had written it in two days. <laughs> I would have spent that much time and more revising it, trying to figure out how to make it good, right? So we have to look at these things. What are we measuring? I'm going to do last check for questions. Doesn't look like I have any, although I see lots of you here, and I hope that you're nodding. I hope you got something out of this. Thank you so much for attending live, and if you're watching the replay, thank you so much. If you're new to this YouTube channel, I would love it if you subscribe, and I actually am going to ask you, there's this, it's talk about algorithms now that it's on my mind youtube has an algorithm too and if you click the little thumbs up if this um, talk was of interest to you click the little thumbs up because apparently the youtube algorithm will then reward us by sharing this channel with more potential viewers and i think that would be really fun i'd appreciate it um, I look forward to seeing you guys next week between now and next week i have the great pleasure of having my first in person on Zoom session with the new Path of the Storyteller students. We have a wonderful new cohort who have just enrolled in the program. They're going to be starting this week. I cannot wait to get with them. Um, but we will continue to do these weekly live streams. So those of you who are, you know, coming week after week, you are on a path to, I, it's a great investment in your writing practice to just keep listening, keep studying and, and don't 
uh, don't be afraid to change what you're doing, you know, try new things in your writing and let me know how it's going. That's really, that is really the only measurement that matters. You know, are you trying new things? Is, is it getting better? So I wish you happy writing until next week and I will see you next time. Thank you.